Um, I'd like to introduce Jim Byrne, who will introduce our panel. Thank you very much, and I'm going to do that in just a moment, um, but if we could start, am I ready to go on? There we are. So thank you all for being here. We're going to tell you about some exciting things that I think are happening with AGU's leadership and, and support and, uh, and with this group of people up here and some of the people in the audience. And so um, I do have a few of the scary typical slides in my presentation talking about where we're going, uh, but this is mostly a very positive initiative and I think we're going to see it that way. So my name is James Byrne. I'm from University of Lethbridge. So this is a very new initiative, literally. I mean, we've been planning this up to almost arriving at, actually we were planning moments ago. Uh, we're still planning and we're gonna be doing a lot of planning over the next few weeks. Um, annual Climate Change Solutions Conferences, uh, sponsored substantially by the American Geophysical Union beginning in summer 2018. Um, that's very exciting. It's an initiative that I think is desperately needed and I think my colleagues here are going to, going to certainly illuminate all of us on, on those, that desperation. I'll also invite you this afternoon at 1.40 to AGU put on a late breaking session related to, to this initiative. Um, it's that the Global Change Session 23H, Climate Solutions, Policy Planning, Science and Engineering in Uncertain Political and Economic Times. So please come there. Uh, some of the co my colleagues in the audience and the colleagues up here will be on the panel and we'll all be there of course to uh, to a talk, and that's in room 252254 this afternoon at 1340. Introductions then. These are all folks who have contributed to this initiative already, and there will be more, uh, but I, I, I included the folks who have already substantially been, been, been aiding us in, in pulling this together. Uh, and I put that in alphabetical order. Richard Ali, of course, who needs no introduction, uh, uh, as many of my colleagues here, but Richard Ali from Pennsylvania State, just to my right, maybe just everybody wave just in case. Uh, James Byrne, as that's me, from University of Lethbridge. Irina Creed uh, from University of Saskatchewan couldn't be here this morning, I don't think, but she's uh, uh, a good contributor and will be on the panel this afternoon. Uh, Roland Krobel from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada down here is an agriculture lead for us. Uh, Mike Mann, who again needs no introduction, from Pennsylvania State. Uh, Sarah Myrie, right, my immediate right from University of Washington, who's making a wonderful, brilliant name for herself with her climate uh, awareness, climate communication, and broader issues. Um, my colleague Kent Pe Peacock, I wish he could be here. He's back in Lethbridge with a fairly significant health problem, so we certainly wish Kent well uh, and that, he, that he's doing better soon. Uh, Stefan Ramsdorf up here today and will be on the panel this afternoon from Potsdam Institute. Um, David Titley over here, David will be on the panel this afternoon. Uh, and Yang Yang Zhu, who is also down here, he will be on the panel this afternoon. So you'll hear from all of us and hopefully it will, it will, it will uh, every one of them will be more exciting than I am, I think. So you have lots to look forward to. Um, climate change is hurting us, without a doubt. Um, so these are my depressing <coughs> slides, just a few of them. You know, I don't have to remind you, you've all covered all of this, right? Um, Houston, uh, India, Bangladesh. Nepal, um, British Columbia, worst fire season ever this year. California, I think right now they've declared it their worst fire season. Um, World Health Organization says 92% of us are being adversely affected by air pollution. Uh, so next time you're sitting at an intersection, just roll down your window a little bit and don't breathe too deeply, but you'll smell it and you'll come to realize how we all live in air pollution. Uh, and climate change conflict is going to hurt us all. So where are we going with this initiative then? We want to bring together, um, you know, people from around the world uh, to to for annual summer meetings to talk about climate change solutions. Um, where are we going? Well, the solutions just aren't windmills and solar panels. They're going to help a lot, but they're going to be much more than that. Climate change solutions are going to be very complex and varied. Um, they change geographically. They change in space. They're going to change in time. They're going to change politically across political boundaries, economic boundaries, and social boundaries. What works for Alberta is not going to work necessarily all the time for Louisiana, is not going to work for Venezuela, is not going to work for Bangladesh, is not going to work for China. Um, you know, we're going to have to look at different solutions depending upon the conditions. Local solutions, regional solutions, investing in local people and regional people and, and building. Uh, climate solutions are definitely multidisciplinary. The science community has done an admirable 
you know, admirable uh, uh, work in getting the message out, but the message still isn't out there enough. We need to educate more people. We need to get the message further and further. Uh, you know, and we need to talk a lot more about solutions, and that's what this initiative. Get us talking, get everybody talking about solutions, because as other colleagues are going to share, that's what the people out there want to hear about. Um, so the goals for our climate change meeting then, for our climate solutions meeting, build capacity to address climate solutions within and across communities. Document solution systems in place or in development for public and private sector applications. Education curriculum for schools, colleges and universities. And of course, refereed publication. So we're going to document this all very well. Um, we're, we're, we're certainly inviting education groups th to work with us. AGU Publications is working with us. Um, it's, it's, it's an exciting initiative. And that is the end of me. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. And I believe, Stefan, we're, we're going to go to Stefan for a few minutes. OK. Doesn't do anything. The <laughs> now I have a mic. Yeah. Uh, good morning. This is my only slide that I want to show here is my key message of uh, this afternoon's session. And uh, the story is that we know we have a problem and the world has finally decided to solve it in the Paris Agreement. And I think that's a very uh, historic agreement and it's in my view also a very good agreement. The major flaw of it is that it comes so late. You know, 10 years earlier, it would have been actually a very a nice agreement, or 15 years earlier, but it has taken decades to negotiate. I remind you that in 1965, we had the first official expert report to a United States president warning about CO2-induced global warming. And so a full 50 years after that, we finally have the Paris Agreement. And the key of the Paris Agreement uh, is the goal to limit global warming to well below two degrees with an aspiration to be closer to 1.5 degrees. And so the question that I want to talk about is what does that mean? How much CO2 can we still emit and how quickly do we have to reduce it? And the first thing to understand there is that the warming that we will end up with is roughly or actually to a pretty good approximation, proportional to the cumulative CO2 emissions of humanity since the beginning of industrialization. That's been shown in the fifth assessment report, for example, has a nice diagram illustrating that. And that means that limiting global warming to a particular temperature level translates into a certain total budget of emissions that we can still put out into the atmosphere. And so the question is, how much is that? And of course, there is uh, considerable uncertainty about how much that exactly is. So there is a range also because the Paris Agreement doesn't stipulate a particular level, but it's kind of from 1.5 to well below 2 degrees. And so you can, that, that already encompasses quite a range, given we're already at about 1 degree warming. And so whether you have another half degree or a full degree to go determines obviously also how much you can still emit. And then there is also uncertainty because uh, it depends a bit on what happens to the other gases other than CO2. Um, and of course, there is an uncertainty in climate sensitivity. So the bottom line is we have a range. But if you look at it, about the, the middle of that range is 600 gigatons of CO2 that we can still emit, uh, which would be compatible with the Paris Agreement. And this slide illustrates in these uh, three solid lines what emission trajectory gets us to 600 gigatons. They are all, all these three curves, the three solid lines, uh, have the same area under the curve. That means the same total emission of 600 gigatons. And it just shows the effect of delay here. So if we started to reduce right now, then the 600 gigatons would allow us to still emit CO2 until about the year 2045 and then we'd have to be at zero emissions. Now, if we wait until 2020 uh, for the emissions to peak, 
then they have to be zero already at 2040. And if we wait another five years and only start to reduce emissions uh, in 2025, then we're basically facing a steep cliff. It, I think everybody would say it's impossible uh, to still fulfill the Paris Agreement uh, with that kind of delay. And that is why it's so incredibly urgent and we, we don't have the time to debate this another th uh, three years or five years before we do anything because the window of opportunity for actually limiting global warming to well below two degrees is actually falling shut on us as we speak. And that, that is my, my message here today. Thank you. Next, I was going to use Stefan's uh, overhead. Do you mind if we, if I, we just go in order this way? Okay. Yeah, I don't have an overhead of my own, so I'm going to use Stefan's here. Um, you didn't ask me for one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you now. <laughs> it's fine, Mike. Oh, thank you. Um, so there are a couple points uh, that I wanted to make here. Uh, first of which is, um, you know, I have a, a daughter who's uh, going to be turning 12 uh, in two weeks, and she's an expert skier. We have a, a, a ski run near our house, and she does. Um, she can do the black double diamond uh, slopes. Uh, I'm still doing the bunny slopes uh, myself, and and I use that as an analogy for what decades of inaction has cost us. If we had acted on this problem decades ago, then this emissions curve that we have to follow would be a bunny slope. We would be able to do it fairly easily. What decades of inaction has bought us is a, a trip down the black double diamond slope, and how how steep that slope gets, as Stefan has explained, is a function of how quickly now we act on this problem. Uh, but there is a credible case to be made uh, that we can still limit warming to below dangerous uh, levels, two degrees Celsius or, or more warming. Uh, that having been said, um, we have done some recent work looking at uh, how we measure uh, the, the warming to date and the role of the pre-industrial baseline. Generally, a late 19th century baseline is used um, to define pre-industrial conditions, and there was several tenths of a, a degree Celsius warming by then due to uh, the increase in CO2 that had occurred by the late 1800s. Um, so uh, we recently published an article, and I'll be talking about this in a, in a talk later this week, um, showing that when you take into account the warming that had already occurred by the, the late uh, 19th century, then there's a, as much as potentially 0.2 degrees Celsius of additional greenhouse warming that had already occurred by then. If you take that into account, then it implies that our carbon budget um, of, of 600 gigatons that uh, Stefan was talking about could be as much as 40% less than that. It could be as much as 40% less than that. We can still do it, but the challenge uh, could be even greater. And obviously, with that, um, the urgency uh, is obviously greater as well, the urgency of acting now. Um, another point I wanted to make, uh, because as, as I uh, often say, the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. Uh, we're seeing them play out in very dramatic ways. And as a result of that, um, I think we're, we're moving away from sort of the, the uh, 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 an environment where outright denial of the science is credible. I, I don't think most people um, find denial of climate change uh, compelling. Uh, but what is happening, um, there's a growing level of sort of doomism and despair. Um, and there has been quite a bit of literature uh, recently that feeds that. There was an article in New York Magazine uh, earlier this year, uh, the title of which was Uninhabitable Earth. Um, it was written by uh, David Wallace Wells. He and I actually participated participated in a panel discussion at uh, the NYU Journalism School a week ago, and, and we discussed this article and sort of the framing of that article. Um, my concern about it was that it sort of feeds a narrative of, of doom um, of, and, and, and a narrative that is potentially paralyzing. If you truly believe that there's nothing we can do to prevent dangerous climate change, it can lead us down the same path of outright climate change denial. If you don't think that we have any agency in acting on this problem, then why do anything to reduce uh, emissions? And indeed, there are some uh, advocates um, out there who have uh, declared that uh, unavoidable uh, warming 
uh, will lead to the extinction of human beings and all other species within 10 years, and there's nothing we can do about it. We've pat passed the point of no return, the tipping point. Uh, I think that is very damaging, uh, first of all, because it's scientifically wrong, as uh, Stefan has already explained here. Um, but it, it does feed this sort of uh, narrative of, of doom, um, which uh, ultimately leads us down uh, the same path, uh, a path of inaction. So I think we have to be very careful in the framing to make it clear that there is still time. The science indicates that there is still time to act to prevent dangerous climate change. And as others here on the panel will discuss uh, shortly, um, there uh, is, um, you know, the, the, the solutions um, to this problem are already available. Um, and they will lead us down a different path, a path of economic prosperity. Uh, the great revolution of this century is the clean energy revolution. And the sooner we jump uh, aboard that train, the better off we will be in terms of our competitiveness here in the United States. Um, so I think it's very important to frame the issue in this way. There is still time. Um, you know, yes, some bad things uh, will happen, some bad things are already happening, but we can prevent the worst impacts from happening, and by solving the problem, we can grow our economy and, and, and help uh, sort of uh, get aboard this, um, you know, the great revolution, uh, the great economic revolution of this century. So I'll leave it there. Okay, so I will follow on, and Jim, when we get the slides, if you can click when I ask you, it would be great. So I, I do not own these maps. I did not help make these maps. They come from the good folks at the Yale Climate Communications. This particular formation was done by CNN. I'm using them under fair use, I hope. Um, this is a way to look at why I believe Jim is leading this effort, why AGU is leading this effort to look at solutions as well as problems. So this is just a view of opinions in the United States on climate change. This is an, one way to look at the United States. Uh, remember that this is by area, not by population. There are almost three times as many people in Philadelphia as in Wyoming, but Philadelphia is much smaller on this map. Um, but what this map is asking first is, is global warming happening? And the redder colors or oranger colors are, yes, more people believe it, towards blue is, is less people believe it. And you'll see there's actually places in the United States that less than half the people even believe it's happening. But now if we click to the next one, um, are we the main cause? It is the same map, but the average has moved down. Okay, and if we click to the next one, um, do scientists agree? If that doesn't make you wonder how strong the scientific agreement is, this is uh, confusion does still reign. Um, click to the next one. Um, is it bad? It's the same map up a little bit. When we talk about problems, this is the map of America. But when you ask, should we do more research on renewable energy? Should we look for solutions rather than problems? Click it again, if you would, please, Jim. When we quit talking about a problem and talk about a solution, what happens to America, all of a sudden we're on board. And this is what Mike said, and I think this is a very important communications point. The last one is for you. And so, are you talking about it to your neighbor? One more click, please. Americans believe we can solve a problem even if they don't believe we have a problem, but they're not talking about it. Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. no, I don't need slides. Okay, let me try to, is that on? Yes. Okay, um, now for something uh, a little bit different. Um, thank you, that was really, um, <laughs> thank you to everyone speaking here, honestly. Um, so I am, um, I'm here today to talk both as a scientist and as a feminist and a cultural leader, someone who thinks very deeply about these issues and someone who cares very deeply, not only about the scientific community, but also how we lead and interface with the rest of the world. I think um, this, this idea of how do we move towards solutions, one of the easiest, cheapest, and most immediate ways of moving towards solutions is changing the way that scientists communicate both internally within our circles 
and externally how we communicate with the general public. Um, we are obviously um, nested inside of a, a, a culture and a society that is go undergoing massive cultural transformation as we see right now with the Me Too movement, the voices of women. These are actually relevant to how we consider ourselves as scientists in society. Um, oftentimes we are instructed as scientists, produce the data, do the work, publish your results and go back and re rinse and repeat in that cycle, right? We deliver information to the public and then the public should have the skills to take that information and act accordingly. I don't actually think that that's if, um, sufficient in order for us to really meet the needs of the public because what I see in the public is a vacuum of leadership. That the public is not only looking for information from us, the public is looking for cultural leadership and that comes with um, changing paradigms of communication and changing the way that we see ourselves in the world. Humanizing science might be a, a particularly important part of that agenda, but the platform that I am going to speak on later today is the real need for scientists um, that are doing this work right now to stand up for human rights in a very public way. Um, if you didn't know, women's rights actually are human rights. Um, we do fit under that same docket. Um, and so standing up for human rights in a public way demonstrates integrity in public because often what we see is scientists saying in the future people are going to have, there will be these consequences, right? We're concerned about people in the future. We're concerned about future generations, the suffering that will come, the cost, the damage to our infrastructure. When we say those things and at the same time we look away from the suffering that is happening next to us, adjacent to us, to people that are living right now, it demonstrates a lack of integrity and a lack of awareness of our real role in the world. So I think one of the most immediate and pressing issues in the communication paradigm in science right now is to advocate both for the rights and the lives of the people that are living right now and to advocate for the lives and the ecosystems and the environments and the economies of the future. Both of those things can happen simultaneously. One doesn't have to come first. We can all go together. And I'm reminded just to close of a moment that I experienced on the way to the Women's March last January. Seattle had, I think, 300,000 people march in the streets um, to stand up for um, equity, justice, science and inclusivity in our culture and I was trying to get to the meeting place to meet everyone um, to meet all these other ladies that I'm gonna and I'm I have my pussy hat on um, and so I am driving there I'm trying to get off in the, the streets are just full of traffic it's streaming people and the um, one option I could have taken was to get really frustrated like all these other people though they're in my way and they're they're not listening to me, they're not letting me drive there. And I think the, um, the realization in this moment in, in moving towards the Women's March was that it takes everyone to get together to demonstrate the need for these cultural changes to happen. And so in that moment of being stuck in traffic on my way to the Women's March, I had a realization that actually this process of everyone, uh, uh, ne needing space for everyone to come to the table, um, is actually one that demonstrates the need for equity and justice and inclusivity in our culture and inside of science. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Okay, so now we'll open it up to questions from reporters in the room. All right. Seth Bornstein, AP, uh, Stefan, uh, Michael. You say there, uh, Richard, if you say there is still time, but you don't want to be overly negative, at, this is actually the message you guys have been saying for 20 years. Um, at what point do you say, okay, if you don't do it at this time period, it's a, you know it's not over, but then we're we're looking at whole different levels. And what is that time period? Um, or, and do you think that people, you know, that governments and people work best under deadline? Um, and giving a perhaps a deadline of, hey, if you don't do this, sort of what you were starting to go at it, Stefan, 
um, with this. Is, is there a point of, we pass, we reach this year and we haven't done more, then we're looking at a whole different world and, you know, we are looking at dangerous warming beyond what we have. Yeah, I'm happy to, to make a few comments and I'm sure the others have thoughts as well. Um, you know, sometimes we, I, I think, inappropriately frame the problem as if there's some cliff, at, you know, it's at, at two degrees Celsius that, that we go off. And, and once you go off the cliff, well, there isn't much more you can do at that point, is there? Um, and, and I think we have to get away from that analogy because it, it's, not, it's, it's not a correct description of the problem that we're confronting. Uh, I prefer to use the analogy of a, a minefield. We're walking uh, out onto a minefield, and the further we go out onto that minefield, the more likely it is that we will trigger an explosion. Um, there isn't one climate tipping point. There are many. Stefan and I have published recently on, on one potential tipping point, the collapse of the overturning circulation of the North Atlantic, and that may actually be underway or we, we may be very close to that. Um, but uh, the, the destruction of the Greenland ice sheet, we may not be there yet. Um, the, there are many other attributes of, of the climate um, that, uh, you know, as you go down that road, 2 degrees, 2.5 degrees Celsius, 3 degrees, you're going to see more of those dangerous and potentially irreversible impacts. So another analogy is that, you know, we're going down a highway, and yeah, maybe we miss the 1.5 degrees Celsius exit. Maybe we miss the 2 degrees Celsius exit. It doesn't mean you continue down that highway. You still get off at the next possible exit. Um, that's my view of how we should be framing this problem. Yeah, I think, um, can I have a, yeah. I think there is two possible answers here. One is what I showed in my diagram, where I said, look, if we are kind of beyond 2020 with the peaking time of emissions, then it becomes practically impossible to still stick to the Paris Agreement. And that's why the article that, that I co-authored uh, with Christiana Figueres that had this diagram uh, was titled uh, Three Years to Safeguard Our Climate. The three years refer to the, the peaking time 2020 at the latest. And I sometimes in my talks I like to show the cover of the German tabloid uh, Bild Zeitung, which had uh, um, some time ago it had a title We Have 16 Years Left, and that was uh, just 13 years ago uh, when we already, as a <laughs> the German Advisory Council for Global Change or the German government, we also said, look, the peak has to be at the latest 2020, the peak in global emissions. And uh, since then, of course, a lot of time has passed and we're we are really at the point where I think most people would say 1.5 degree is already pretty much impossible. But of course, we have to continue on fighting, even if we are at the two degrees, I imagine, that humanity then would be in a much more desperate struggle to prevent uh, three degrees warming. The earlier we do it, the better it is. Now, the second answer is uh, what Mike has alluded to is a question of the tipping points in the climate system. And there are points of no return where things become irreversible, like uh, the loss of the entire Greenland ice sheet or the loss of West Antarctica, for example. The problem with these tipping points is, although they are probably sharp tipping points that are crossed in one particular year, we don't know where these thresholds are. So even if there is definite tipping points, we have a large uncertainty of where they are and whether you have crossed them. And the further you go along that wrong highway, as Mike put it, the greater the risk is that you are crossing tipping points and uh, you or your children or grandchildren will deeply regret that you did that, even if you know there's no explosion at the moment you do it and you, you don't even know for sure whether we have crossed the tipping point like in the West Antarctic ice sheet, probably we already have and we are committed to at least three meters of sea level rise due to that, but we can't be 100% certain of that. Uh, good morning, Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS at the American Geophysical Union. Um, do you uh, see any opportunities for getting things done, for making progress in the current U.S. national political environment and in, within the Trump administration? And if so, what? Yeah. 
Hi. I'm if we could get this, thanks. Uh, I'm Dave Titley from Penn State. So I'll, I'll give you an example of actually some things that if you get beyond the tweets of the morning uh, are actually quite constructive going on in, the Congre in this Congress, in this United States Congress today. So a year ago, uh, the US House of Representatives, when they debated the Defense Authorization Act, basically put in language that said there is no climate change uh, the Department of Defense should not worry about it, and for God's sakes, don't spend any money on it. That was 2016. Have the election this year, and I would argue, although it's a different Congress, the makeup, the political makeup is pretty similar. Uh, this year, uh, when the House debated the defense resolution, there was an amendment submitted by Jim Langevin uh, that basically said, hey, Department of Defense, climate change is a big deal. You guys need to pay attention and tell us what you're doing. It was just a report. Uh, that survived. And it survived committee, and then it went to a floor vote. And on the floor vote, there were 46 Republicans who voted in favor of that. Another eight uh, realized their Starbucks coffee had just run out, so they had to abstain. Uh, so you had over 50 Republicans, roughly one quarter of the Republican caucus, not voting against a climate amendment in the defense bill. Pardon the double negative. Uh, that's a huge change. So fast forward, uh, there is similar language in the Senate version of the Authorization Act. It survives conference, it survives the full vote of the Congress, and it is either being signed or is about to be signed by the President. He's not gonna veto it for this language. There's just too much other things in the Defense Authorization Act. This is huge because now we have a law uh, that says for the Department of Defense, it's not policy, it's not somebody's good idea, it's the law that says, what are you gonna do and tell us what you're gonna do. And the way, of course, it works in Washington is that's the first step. You identify the differences and then the second part is you hold hearings and then it's like, okay, now how are we going to address these? So there was almost nobody a year ago, especially post-election, who would have guessed this outcome. Uh, and I'll tell you, having worked in the Department of Defense for over 30 years, uh, if I can have only the executive or only the legislative branch behind me, I will take the legislative branch every day. They come, they have the money, they pass laws, uh, and it's much uh, more solid ground than, than, let's say, an administration policy or a presidential tweet or something like that. So that's, that's one example of, of some good news that really gets lost in most of the silliness that's going on right now. Uh, I'm happy to follow up on that. Um, Dave uh, Titley, uh, myself, uh, Richard Alley, uh, we're all Penn Staters, um, and so I think it would be appropriate to use a football analogy here. Um, right now, we have our, our de defense on the field for most of the game. Uh, we are playing defense, and the defense is, is wearing down inevitably. Um, what We're seeing a, a rolling back of uh, all of the environmental protections of the past half century, environmental protections that were passed under both Republican and Democratic administrations. Uh, we're seeing an assault on um, the, the scientific world. Uh, we are seeing a cut in funding for climate science, um, and now uh, the uh, EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt, as some of you may have read, wants to have this fake red team, blue team debate uh, about climate change to undermine uh, the public's faith uh, in the, the basic science of climate change. So needless to say, um, at a time when we need to have the offense on the field, if we are going to avert dangerous warming, the U.S. has to be playing a leadership role in the world as one of the two largest emitters. Um, but we're playing defense. We're, we don't have our offense on the field. Um, we need to get our offense back on the field. Uh, there's a midterm election coming up in less than a year. Just to add to that, right now, the scholarship is actually clear that efficient policies, efficient responses that would address this issue improve the environment, but they improve the economy. And there are a lot of people in the United States and in the world who like the environment. There are a lot of people in the United States and the world who like the economy. And if you fall in either of those categories, there's still hope. All right, do we have any other questions from reporters in the room? Thanks, I'm Gabe Popkin, a freelancer in the DC area. Um, Sarah, I was really intrigued by your point, and I guess I'd be interested to hear more. I, 
I think that uh, what the, the sort of focus on the future that you mentioned seems to have that sort of opened up an opportunity for Donald Trump to sort of focus on the present suffering of certain people and who felt like they weren't being heard in the whole climate conversation. Um, what, what would you, what kind of specific things would you recommend that your, maybe your colleagues up on the stage or other climate scientists do in terms of changing how they communicate with the public? Um, so thank you for that question. Am I on? No. Yes. I can't hear. Get close. Get close. Um, so in my talk later today, I have communication and leadership recommendations for institutions senior scientists and junior scientists. Um, my uh, leadership recommendations for institutions include, um, be because we spend, we invest a lot of time and attention into, in training a generation of scientists to communicate, science communication should be taught at the same time that social justice and equity issues should be taught. So those things should be coupled so that when scientists participate in public dialogue, they're able to evaluate how their speech will be received by an uneven playing field. The idea that my communication of science is going to be received in the same way in the culture as my colleague who is a white man, that idea is bankrupt. It's not true. The, the landscape of credibility and the landscape of authority is deeply slanted away from women and people of color succeeding in communicating their science in public. So if we're interested in everyone succeeding and being able to bring the best and brightest ideas to the table, then we need to evaluate how the way we teach communication practices does a deep disservice to women and people of color. So that, that is an institutional, that's a way we can allocate funds and change how we teach students. So that, that there are different dockets of sort of actions and priorities around this. Um, it's a really hard question, though, because, for example, I, you know, as a woman in public speaking about climate change, when I talk about climate change, what I receive is misogyny. When I talk about feminism, what I receive is misogyny. Um, women scientists are being actively harassed and demeaned in public on the internet by senior scientists. Um, it's a toxic a uh, pylon that happens to people that look like me and sound like me. And this again is a problem for the community because when people that look like me and sound like me are eroded, our authority is eroded in public, we as a community are diminishing our ability to connect with the public, communicate our science, and to serve um, the public's interests in reducing risk and reducing cost. So evaluating equity and evaluating the landscape of communication, this is not like light and fluffy, cutty pasty sort of stuff. This is actually the, the meat of how we as a community of scientists interfa interface with the rest of the world. And that, that vacuum is not being um, well attended and well ex evaluated um, at an institutional level and at uh, the level of the individual scientist. Uh, Bud Ward with Yale Climate Connections. Uh, Richard, I'd like to get behind your thinking a little bit. Um, you're obviously well regarded as a scientist and as a communicator. And yet, when I see letters on public policy issues signed by hundreds and sometimes thousands of respected climate scientists, you're not there. You're not the only one. Chris Fields is another one. Now, obviously, your approach is much different than Mike Mann's approach, for instance, or Ben Santer's. But tell me, you know, I was struck the other day, very briefly, um, when the senior senator from Alabama, Richard Shelby, went public and said, principle dictates that I go public, I won't vote for Ray Moore, for, uh, for Moore, for senator. So he was moved by principle. I understand that you might see things differently, but can you give us a little bit of your background uh, why do you not sign those kinds of letters? Are you doing something in behind the scene? I wonder, and I sometimes hope. Is that the answer? Yeah. 
So I can tell you that I've had the, the good fortune to speak with uh, elected representatives and appointed representatives in the government from both sides of the aisle in multiple administrations over a long time. And I have been treated with respect by elected and appointed officials from both sides of the aisle for a long time. I believe it is very important for all, for the scientific community to be able to speak with everyone without um, cheap walls that would prevent a respectful discussion on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I think that the scientific community needs a very wide range of communicators, and I think we need to be able to talk to people who might view certain statements, certain positions, certain signatures as disqualifying to have that discussion. I hope that I am acting deeply on principle. I believe I am. Okay, I think that's just about our time. Do we have any questions from the web chat? No? Do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? All right, then this will conclude our press conference. Thank you guys so much for uh, being here. And we'll start again at nine o'clock um, with the Arctic report card. <laughs>